Hey guys, Jason, Ham Radio 2.0. This is episode 101 from the Dayton Hamvention 2017, the Digital Voice Modes Forum, and it starts right now. Today's episode of Ham Radio 2.0 is brought to you by Gifts for Hams. Find their website at www.gifts4hams.com. Get your call sign or club logo engraved on virtually anything you want. Specializing in ham radio related gift ideas, Gifts for Hams is your one stop shop for lighted call sign displays, coffee mugs, coasters, drinking glasses, smartphone cases, and so much, much more. Laser engraving and etching to show off your ham radio call sign or club. Shop gifts4hams.com and tell them that Ham Radio 2.0 sent you. This thing kissing, okay. So today I'm going to be talking about um, an introduction to cheap SDRs for uh, radio monitoring. I um, just want to give an introduction to myself quickly, uh, so probably most people here don't know who I am. Um, about four years ago, I purchased an RTL SDR dongle on a whim, and I didn't really know what it was. From the moment I received it, um, I got so hooked that I decided to start blogging about it. And so for the past four years now, I've been running this blog called rtl-sdr.com. And on this blog, I've been collecting stories that relate to low-cost SDR. Uh, and more recently, higher end, yet still relatively cheap SDRs like the SDR Play, AirSpy, and HackRF. Uh, so at some point, I decided to start using the blog to launch a business, selling my own RTL SDR dongles. And over time, I've used the profits from the sales to improve the dongles and make them better for people using them as general purpose SDRs. I'm now up to version 3, and I believe this is probably the most valuable dongle, uh, RTL SDR dongle on the market. I've also started up a community called um, SIGID Wiki, which is basically a wiki of a collection of uh, signal sounds and sights on waterfall images, which is useful for uh, helping people identify unknown signals. Okay, so for those that don't really know what an RTL SDR, let me quickly explain. Uh, the RTL SDR is an extremely low cost uh, RX only software defined radio. And by low cost, I'm talking about uh, 10 to 30 uh, US dollars, depending on the quality of the device. So the question is, where did these RTL SDR dongles actually come from, and who owns them? So firstly, nobody really owns the RTL SDR. It's basically a community-based project uh, based on cheap DVB-T dongles. Now, in the USA, you don't have DVB-T here. So if you don't know what it is, let me quickly explain that DVB-T is the digital TV video standard that is used in most of the world apart from a few countries like America. So, of course, around the world there, is a, there are millions of people who want to watch DVB-T TV on their um, laptops and computers. So these dongles are extremely heavily mass produced in China. And this makes them very cheap, of course. So for the, base, for the most basic model, um, you could probably buy about 10,000 or so units in bulk for about $5 each from the factory in China. So that means mean that they must cost something like two or three dollars to produce. Of course, the improved units, like uh, the one that I'm selling, do cost a bit more because of the increased number of components and the better components used in them. So, how did a DVB-T dongle turn into a general-purpose radio? About five years ago, some hardware hackers like um, Osmocom team, NT, uh, Palosari, and Eric Fry were looking into these dongles and essentially. They were trying to write Linux TV drivers for the um, for for Linux for using the dongle on Linux. So essentially, they were um, they discovered that there was an SDR feature on the Realtek RTL 2832U chips, which was used on these dongles. And it turns out that this SDR feature was a lot more versatile than they first thought. So with some custom drivers, they soon had the device running over um, a frequency range of 24 megahertz up to about 1.7 gigahertz with 2.4 megahertz of bandwidth available. And once the drivers were out there, it was suddenly an extremely cheap, cheapest chips RX radio 
that was available on the market, which could receive almost any interesting frequency. Now people could write decoders for anything in software without needing to fiddle around with specialist radio hardware. So this ease of access to radio has opened up a whole new world of radio experimentation, and new blood started pouring into the radio world. So people like software programmers, electronics people, and so on started getting interested in radio for the first time. Also, a lot of old uh, blood, such as hams who were bored of the hobby, started coming back to experiment again uh, with radio, thanks to this explosion in cheap SDR technology. So one thing that I worked on in the last year was re redesigning the basic RTL SDR to make it significantly more useful for radio enthusiasts. Because let's face it, the original dongles had a vast number of issues with them. For example, they had a drifty oscillator, which made every single drift in frequency as the temperature of the PCB changed. Uh, they also had no shielding, so interference was a problem. They had lots of spurs all over the spectrum, and many had problems in, um, in L-band at around 1.5 gigahertz due to an overheating problem. And they also used a really uncommon MCX RF connector. So to fix these problems, I worked with the factory in China to redesign the dongle into one that better ne meets the needs of SDR radio experimenters. So first, we replaced the cheap oscillator with a quality TCXO, um, which stands for Temperature Compensated Oscillator. And these oscillators automatically adjust themselves as the temperature changes in order to keep the uh, frequency stable. Next, they added a metal enclosure to improve the RF shielding and redesigned the PCB, uh, added things like ferret chokes and line filters. Um, and to fix the L-band problem, um, added a thermal pad which works away the heat from the PCB and puts it to the metal case, which acts as a heat sink. Uh, we also changed the MCX connector um, into a more robust, uh, commonly used SMA connector. I also added some interesting features like a bias T, so you could power a remote LNA uh, through phantom power, and added support for HF tuning by adding a direct sampling circuit. So if you go on eBay or AliExpress or Amazon or any online store and type in RTL SDR, then you're probably going to see dozens of different types of units out there. The one that is sold on my blog is the one on the left, and it costs about $20 for um, one without the basic antenna set, and uh, 25 to 30 for one with the antenna set, including uh, shipping from China. So these dongles tend to, um, the basic dongles, tend to look like the, uh, the one, these ones over here. And they come with uh, a CD, which basically has uh, pirated DVB-T software on it. So those usually go for about eight to 10 US dollars. Um, but as I explained before, they do have some problems. Um, so it's probably better to get a higher end model. There's also various other dongles in the market, such as um, those really small ones that come in a uh, really small size of one centimeter by one centimeter. And those are great for using on things like mobile phones. Um, and there's also the E4000 chip and these tend to be quite a bit more expensive because the manufacturer of that chip actually went out of business. But the most commonly used chips on the, um, the tuner chips on these dongles are the RA20T2s, and they're probably actually better than those um, older tuning chips when, uh, which we have been replaced now. Okay, so this is an image of uh, SDR Sharp. So once you've downloaded the drivers um, and installed the dongle and opened up a program called SDR Sharp, you should see a screen like this on the, on the computer. So at the, top, at the top of the screen, you have the frequency selector. So basically, you just enter the frequency that you want to listen to in there. Um, on the left, you have the mode selection. So you can select things like uh, narrowband FM, AM, um, wideband, uh, single sideband modes and CW. Um, you also have the spectrum analyzer screen and the waterfall screen. So each of these spikes on this screen is uh, some sort of a, a voice signal or a trunking uh, ch control channel. I just want to quickly say that this is not my software. This is um, software written by um, the guy who creates the AirSpy, but he's kindly made this software available for the RTL SDR. And there's a lot more software available for the RTL SDR as well that's very similar to this. So the question is now, how do you receive uh, HF with an RTL SDR? So because the lowest tuning range of the most of the generic RTL SDRs is only down to 24 megahertz. However, 
if you have a, the one that I created, um, the V3, it uses something called direct sampling mode, which can uh, access the HF bands. But another method of obtaining the HF reception is to use an up converter. Now an up converter basically converts the lower HF frequencies up into the receivable range of the RTL SDR. And at the moment, if you want to buy an up converter, the one that I recommend the most is the one called uh, Spyverter, which is actually designed for the AirSpy, but it works just fine for the um, RTL SDR as well. And up converters usually have slightly better HF performance than the direct sampling mode, but they do cost a bit more. So an up converter might cost you about 50 bucks. So now I just want to talk about some of the applications that an RTL SDR could be used for. So one thing that I've seen people use RTL SDRs for is for monitoring whisper. So if you have an HF capable RTL SDR, you should be able to set up a very cheap $20 whisper receiver. And if you go on YouTube, you can check out a channel. Uh, his name is Very OK. And he shows how to set up an extremely simple whisper uh, monitoring setup, which consists of an RTL SDR dongle um, that uses direct sampling mode. Um, and just a simple long wire plugged into his dongle and with the dongle plugged into the laptop. So the setup steps then are to basically just uh, synchronize your PC clock to NTP, plug in your RTL SDR, tune to a whisper frequency, and pipe that audio into uh, Whisper X, which is the Whisper decoding program. Another digital mode that can be decoded uh, with an RTL SDR um, is DRM, or digital radio mondial. So DRM is a digital broadcast standard that sort of aims to eventually replace or supplement shortwave radio, perhaps. So here in this image, you can see the difference between um, what a DRM signal and a shortwave AM broadcast signal might look like on the waterfall display. So there's actually a free program out there called Dream, which is available on the internet, which can be used to decode these DRM signals. And here in this image on the top of this um, slide, I'm showing um, that I'm decoding the Vatican DRM radio station. So this is a very cheap way to get into DRM shortwave listening, as dedicated DRM radios tend to be quite rare and expensive at the moment. And this is probably one of the main reasons that has, it has trouble becoming a popular medium. If you're interested in DRM, there's also another SDR that I've heard of recently called the um, the Patron X Titus II SDR, which promises to be a portable DRM solution. And inside, it's uh, basically a low-cost SDR, but uh, perhaps not an R2 SDR, something else, and an Android tablet. Now, if you're interested in coding any ham modes with an R2 SDR, then the multi-PSK software is probably a good bit. Multi-PSK uh, PSK is a free program that has many modes available However, if you want to use any of the so-called professional modes, then you'll need to purchase a license, which is not that much. So unlike most programs where you need to pipe in the digital audio using vir uh, virtual audio cable, multi-PSK directly supports the RTL SDR. So you can tune directly to the frequency you want within multi-PSK, press the mode you want to monitor, and you should be all good. So in this slide, I just want to show you that the RTL SDR can be used as a remote uh, networked SDR. Uh, that is an SDR that is positioned close to the antenna and streams digital radio data down to a PC via a network connection. Then you can use the dongle as if it was connected directly to your PC. This is advantageous for a few reasons. One being that you can then place the RTL SDR directly by the antenna, avoiding any long runs of lossy coax cable. Um, and so, of course, digital data on a network connection is uh, loss-free in terms of signal attenuation. Another advantage is that you can even access the radio over the internet from a faraway place. So you could set up your streaming radios at your friends' houses. And to set up a streaming server, you'd use a program like one called RTL TCP, or one, or a more recently better program called uh, Spy Server. But these programs stream the raw digital data with the demodulation being handled on the PC side. So they can actually use up quite a large amount of network bandwidth, and they're not really great for streaming over the internet, over a local network. For the internet, you can use an RTL-SDR compatible program um, called OpenWebRx, 
which only transmits the spectrum data and compressed audio. And this is very efficient for sharing your RTLSTR on the internet. Um, so if you if you go to str.hu, str you'll be able to see a lot of um, people who have put their SDRs on the internet and can be accessed from all over the world. So if you go to str.hu and connect to um, an RTLSTR, you'll see a screen like this. So in this example, I've connected to an RTLSTR in the Ukraine from my home town um, in Auckland, New Zealand, which is pretty much literally on the other side of the earth. So the streaming was completely smooth, and the audio quality was great. So I was able to listen to this band um, in Europe without any issues. So again, just like SDR Sharp, this shows the, the waterfall, and you can just tune to any of these signals just by clicking on them. So of course, the RTLSTR can also be used to listen to digital voice channels um, for very cheap. For example, police emergency services are going digital these days, and to listen to them, you need a digital capable radio, which could be a big expense. So instead of spending that much money, you should consider that an RTLSTR can do the same job. So digital protocols like P25 and DMR can be easily decoded into speech by a program called DSD+. Of course, only unencrypted communications can be listened in on, so there's no, really, there's no way to listen to an encrypted channel, of course. And another version of uh, DSD can also be used to decode the DSTAR digital voice standard, which is used, on, uh, used by HAMS. So if you're interested in the business band and want to follow trunked radio conversations, then you can set this up with two dongles and a program called Unitrunker. Basically, one dongle is then is used to listen to the control channel, and the second dongle is used to listen to the voice channel. So Unitrunker gets its instructions from the control channel and automatically tunes to the correct trunking voice frequency so that you can follow uh, groups without hearing other conversations. So one digital mode on VHF that is popular with HAMS is the Amateur Radio Packet Reporting System, or APRS. So you can actually use an RTLSTR to set up an APRS iGate, which essentially receives the APRS signals and uploads them to the internet. Of course, it can't transmit, so it's a receive-only iGate. But you could set it up together with another transmit-capable radio for that purpose. The system actually runs on a Raspberry Pi, which, if you don't know what it is, it's a almost credit-sized computer that is capable of running Linux and the RTLSTR. And if you're interested in this thing, the APRS iGate software is called Direwolf. So, as many of you know, in recent years, there's been quite an increase in the number of um, amateur radio and CubeSat satellites that have been launched. Most of these CubeSats contain on board a transmitter and transmit some telemetry data, as well as maybe sometimes something like a science experiment. The problem is that these satellites have um, very low data rates, and so they can't dump all their data quickly enough when they travel over their home base station. So instead, they constantly uh, transmit low data rate um, signals and rely on ground stations position positioned all over the Earth to receive the signal. However, the problem is that there still isn't enough ground stations. So SatNOX is a project that hopes to put easy uh, to build ground stations into the hands of anyone interested in running one. And the ground stations consist of 3D printed gears, motors, and computing hardware, uh, directional Yagis and Helix antennas, and an RTLSTR dongle for reception. Uh, the system is designed to automatically track satellites as they pass over the horizon uh, by using the gear and motor systems. The SatNOG software then receives the signal via the RTLSTR, decodes the data, and uploads that data to the internet, which can then be accessed by anyone, including the satellite's owner. Um, so I don't know if you've been around um, Hamm Engineer, but SatNOX actually have a booth here, which you, and you can go ask them about it. And there's also another company called Thumbnet, which is proposing a very similar solution, but they are mainly focusing on uh, getting their RTLSTR-based uh, receivers into schools, which would operate the ground stations uh, for them. And at the same time, these schools would learn about uh, space satellites and radios. So, Another service that you can receive with the RTLSTR on L-band at 1.5 gigahertz is something called the Outernet. And the Outernet is a fairly new L-band satellite service which makes use of the Inmarsat 
and alpha sat satellites that are in geosynchronous orbit. So this means that they are in a fixed position in the sky at all times. The service is for file casting, which basically means that um, downloading data from the satellite. So I just want to clarify that uh, the outer net is not uh, an internet service, but rather it's a one-way download service. Uh, so the owners and outer net community actually decide what, which, uh, what things the satellite should broadcast. And every day there's about uh, this bandwidth for about 20 megabytes of data. And typically you'll get things like uh, the latest news, weather updates, um, they also do APRS and MSAT um, repeats, uh, Wikipedia articles, group files for Mariners, and sometimes things like free books. So this service is very useful for people who need an alternative source of information other than the internet. For example, people in uh, like disaster preppers, sailors, people in remote areas, or in people in countries with censored internet, and people in third world countries without any access to the internet. And this service uses uh, RTLSDR for reception. So I'm at the end of my presentation now. In the conclusion, uh, I just want to say that um, SDR is a very cheap, uh, yet highly versatile receiver. And there's literally hundreds and hundreds of applications uh, that it can be used for. And if you want to see more information about it, you can go to the rtl-sdr.com blog and go through the history. Um, and if you want to buy a V3 dunkle here uh, at Hanvention, the Tapper booth has some in Building 5. RNL in building one, and the SDR guys in the flea market should have some as well. So thank you for listening. We are the AG Zurich. Thank you very much. Uh, we wouldn't be hams if we couldn't uh, fix that together, right? Um, I'm talking for the DV4 group. Uh, and I uh, want to give you an update of uh, what's new and exciting. Who is the DB4 group? The DB4 group is uh, five to ten hams that have been working over ten years uh, building um, digital networks, uh, DCS, X Reflector, uh, DMR Plus, uh, P25 uh, networks. Fusion networks, building hardware for that, starting with the DVR PTR1, 2, 3. Right now we have the DV4 Mini that uh, some of you, most of you, will probably know. Uh, all this uh, has been developed by our, uh, let's call him chief engineer, uh, Torsten, who is sitting there. Uh, Torsten, <laughs> okay. Uh, he's making sure that I don't tell you complete nonsense this afternoon. And uh, today I want to talk about uh, what we did in the last few months. First, uh, the sad news, if I would have got, gotten a dollar for each time I have been asked the last two days when the DB4 mobile comes, I could retire by now. Um, fact is, uh, it's not on sale yet. We are currently putting 200 boards together for the beta testers. Uh, we'll sell those radios for about $800, and then uh, after the beta test phase for $1,200. It will happen this year, um, but uh, don't nail me now down on a certain date, because everything uh, I say will be used against me, so I'll bleeding the fifth on this one. Uh, it's hard to tell because we depend on ship manufacturers, and uh, sometimes uh, it takes two weeks until we get an answer, so it's it's not always uh, in under our control. What works right now um, is the uh, downloading of the uh, what does that thing work? Press it, push it, turn it. I think I found a button. Yeah, okay. Uh, the the LTE code block works. Um, for those who don't know what it is, and there has been some confusion on the internet. Um, it's basically, uh, we have a central database and whenever you turn the radio on, the programming information is downloaded uh, through the cellular network so you don't have to program it. We have a contract with the Norwegian Telecom of all places um, worldwide and uh, if you uh, use it in the US, uh, it will be, uh, technically it will be T-Mobile or AT&T that downloads the programming so you don't have to program your own code block. That's up and running for three months now, works fine. 
The CPU board, and I will show you that later, uh, works as well. Uh, it's a Freescale processor, and we use it in the DV4 home as well. And uh, that price, that's wrong, it's 800, that was a typo, uh, will be the beta test price. Uh, we will offer that to the people that uh, paid the $35, which doesn't really help us much in financing, but it made sure that uh, we know that there is some real interest in not just putting your name down on a list. Uh, what we can ship next week, or let's say June, is the DV4 Home version 2. Uh, you can see it on our booth. Uh, the DV4 Home, uh, for those who don't know what it is, is a uh, purely internet-based all-mode radio, so you can do D-Star, EMR, Fusion, P25, NXDN um, with uh, this radio, which is uh, in the basic version, not really, it doesn't even have an RF. Um, but uh, you can do all modes. It can do cross mode. That means you can, uh, let's say on the back, you can put in a, a DB4 Mini, and you can then, that runs D-Star, and you can then work Fusion or one um, DMR back to the network. It has two MB chips in there, and it uh, translates any mode. Uh, this is a development case uh, with a 3D printer. And uh, you see there is a baseboard. And then, and it's better visible on the next picture, you see this this, uh, this board. This board is uh, an IMX6 from Freescale. It's basically a, a full-blown PC running Debian 8. And uh, we have a HDMI interface. Uh, so you can connect up to UHD, so a 4K monitor to it if you want. And that's the same board, the same processor board as we have in the DB4 mobile. So that means that uh, if you have a problem with finding space for your DB4 mobile, you could as well take uh, a gooseneck, uh, a monitor on a, on a gooseneck, and go through with the touch screen through the USB interface and control it from there. So that's, that's another uh, possibility then for remote control. Um, see here the two MB chips. And uh, as I said, uh, that thing uh, will, will ship uh, next week. Um, the price will be $499. Uh, you will also have to complete a control center on board. So uh, uh, compared to the DV4 Home, the first one, you don't need an extra PC because you can directly connect uh, a, term, uh, a, a monitor and uh, a keyboard and a mouse uh, to the back. Now, uh, on the EV4 Mini software, uh, we accidentally published uh, a development version uh, last night uh, for the Respian, uh, and uh, it showed uh, the My Room feature, which we didn't want to really publish yesterday, but uh, it went out, so it is what it is. Um, what is my room? Um, in all these modes uh, we, uh, where we have servers, we, we, there were people calling us, oh, I'm in Belfast. I want to have a room for Belfast. Oh, we do Aries. I need another room for Aries. Well, in Fusion or in DMR? Well, both. So that kept us pretty busy uh, uh, maintaining all these rooms on these uh, repeaters or uh, reflector systems. So Torsten had the idea said, why don't we allow everybody to have his own room? Five, six people can log in and can do so in any mode. So you can have your friend who has a D-Star radio, another friend who has a Fusion radio, a third a friend that has a DMR radio. You make up your own room here with your call sign, or you call it uh, can give it, a, I think, any name. Uh, is that right? You can. Is, is it just your name, your call sign, or any name? Any name, and uh, then uh, there is a list on the internet uh, that you can see um, on a website, uh, XRF11, actually, uh, and then you see the list of people 
that are there, and then uh, you have your own reflector system, the virtual reflector system. Now, the cool thing is it does transcoding. So you can do multiple modes. You have here, uh, you see DMR, you see C4FM here. What you also have is, uh, is a chat room. So while the one party is talking, the other guys uh, can say, um, can you come on a different channel or can we do this or that? So that's basically a, a, a side channel if you want. Uh, another thing uh, that uh, is now uh, more prevalent, uh, we had it uh, last year in, a, in an early version, is the uh, IPSC 2. What is IPSC 2? It's IP Site Connect version 2. And it solves uh, a DMR problem that the ham radio community had for quite a while. The fact that we have separate uh, reflector systems. Uh, it interconnects DMR plus, which in its roots was uh, high terra based and uh, it connects it to the Motorola based system. So you can have a, a DMR plus, DMR master, you can have a DMR mark, which is running typically on a Rayfield C bridge, and you can interconnect the two using the IPSC2. Until recently, uh, we could only do one channel um, per, per link. Now we can support what they call at Rayfield the CC-CC mode, so we can have multiple talk groups that we can bridge between the two worlds. How does that look? Here is an uh, older example, older release, but uh, I like it because it shows a little bit better the concept that is a, uh, uh, a control panel. And the control panel, you see you have links to other IPSC servers or C bridges. Then you see a whole bunch of Motorola repeaters. Then you see a C bridge again, and then you see a whole bunch of Hytera repeaters. So we can really run both Hytera as well as Motorola from a single reflector system. The respective admins of these, uh, these are all uh, repeaters, can then select what talk groups they want to subscribe to. Now this is uh, obviously uh, an IPSC in, in Vienna, in Austria, that's why you have the, all the Oscar Echo once, but uh, we have it running in the US in the meantime. In this case, basically, uh, this, um, this uh, repeater decided he wants to have the worldwide talk group, the EU, DACH is uh, Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, and, and, and the Austrian one, and that's it. But uh, this guy here in Switzerland, he only, well, mostly wants, to, obviously, to listen to the Swiss traffic. Now this is the uh, one of the US versions, that's the one we use in Florida. Uh, we are connecting um, uh, our repeaters to the K4 USD system, which is uh, distributing uh, to Birmingham, uh, distributing um, to Brandmeister and to, um, to uh, DMR Mark. And the way we set that up, and that's a, a little bit of a problem, I don't know, most of you guys probably know um, the DMR mark way, and in the DMR mark way, you have your talk groups in time slot one and in time slot two. In DMR plus, you have a fixed talk group on, uh, which is talk group nine on time slot two, and then we have rooms in time slot two. Now, if we want to run concurrently a repeater that is half DMR mark network wise and half DMR plus, what we do is we use time slot one. Uh, for mostly the DMR mark traffic and time slot 2 for the rooms. In this case, we have 4639 USA nationwide on time slot 2, but everybody can change it from his radio. Just type in the four digit number, boop, and you are on Florida or whatever you, you want to go. And uh, in time slot 1, what we do here, because we have a lot of uh, German speaking hams in, in our area, we have um, uh, 262, which is Germany. Uh, but we also have uh, talk group two, which is the traffic from all the Motorola repeaters that we have coming down from Tampa. So we have a whole string 
of, of repeaters that cover the complete coast. It doesn't matter whether it's Motorola or Hytera or whatever. Uh, we, we just talk on talk with two and it works fine. Uh, that's the way it looks. You see here the Hytera AB4NP that we have. The C bridge goes to K4 USD. And then we have uh, for the time slot 2, the 4639. This is the new repeater for Marco Island, K5 MI, which will come up hopefully next week, which we already configured. And again, you see here um, that the repeater owner can then select different talk groups just by clicking on it. You can now also use the Mini, of course, to talk to a, a Motorola group. So what you do is you go on your uh, control panel and you select, in this case, the IPSC bridge, Naples, here. And uh, you go on t time slot 1 and talk group 2 and you can talk into the Motorola system. Questions? Okay. Either I was talking over your heads or everything was clear, I guess. <laughs> okay, thank you, Yudi. We'll talk to you a little bit about what's new with 3DV. 3DV has been around uh, several years. Uh, I've replaced uh, a program called FDMDV. It was written by VG, uh, VK5DGR, uh, David Rowe, uh, down in uh, Australia and it's uh, become a pretty popular mode uh, on HF. So we'll talk a little bit about how getting on, um, getting on the air with uh, FreeDV, uh, the voice uh, SM1000, a FreeD hardware adapter, uh, no PC required, and uh, the new VHF and uh, HF modes. Uh, FreeDV is an open source digital voice for HF and VHF radios. Uh, when we talk about it, it uses a Kodak a modem, uh, has a forward error correction, has a graphic uh, user interface for Windows, Ubuntu, and uh, OS X uh, Apple. Uh, there's a free DV uh, application program interface, uh, integrates uh, quite easily with SDRs. I'll we'll talk about the SM1000 uh, and uh, a relatively new mode in uh, free DV called 700C. Uh, works works down into around uh, 4 dB or so, and the new uh, VHF modes 2400A and uh, 800X. So how uh, to get on uh, the air with uh, free dB if it's free dB is new to you. Uh, again, that combines an open source modem uh, with Kodak 2. That's also open source. By open source, I mean everything in this uh, whole project has been open source. It's available to any of developers that want to work on it. It uh, has a desktop a graphic user interface, as I mentioned, for Linux. Uh, Ubuntu is very popular. Uh, it will work with Windows 10 and OS X. and allows any a single sideband radio uh, to be used for uh, digital voice. It also can be used with an FM radio, as far as that's concerned. But uh, mainly its uh, use uh, early on was for using it with uh, any uh, digital voice or with any SSB radio. In the last five years, it's kind of fairly, become fairly popular and it has uh, several different modes. I'll talk about those. Uh, here's what the GUI uh, looks like. Um, has a, a number of uh, windows for looking at the uh, uh, transmit and receive signal. There's a signal noise ratio bar over here. Uh, this is a, a level of audio level for both input and output so you know how to set your microphone and your audio out from your uh, receiver. It has uh, the modes on the side here. Uh, also a squelch uh, uh, control right here so you don't hear uh, open squelch. You can set it at different signal noise ratios. It will operate in a split mode so you can actually operate if, if someone comes in off, off frequency you can split and Work, work them without moving your transmitter. And you can quickly go to a single sideband by hitting the uh, analog button right here. We have a lot of problems with interference on uh, digital voice because a lot of people don't know what it is and obviously it just sounds like noise. So they'll come on the air 
we can quickly uh, switch over to analog and ask them uh, uh, politely to move. Push to talk here, or you can use the uh, uh, space bar. Down at the bottom here where it says free DV, for those of you who can see it, you can also put your call sign, a little short text uh, message here, and it gives an error indication of this data right here with these checksums. Also, it has a bit error rate uh, indicator here on the side, giving you an idea how good the signal is. Here it is in Windows with a constellation, the spectrum here, and a waterfall here. The tuning on this, this particular mode, this is a 1600, uh, is done right in here is the uh, pilot or the uh, sync signal, and it's normally set around uh, 1500. You got about 100 hertz uh, that you can move up and down, so it doesn't have to be exactly on, on frequency for it to uh, uh, start decoding. You can see a guy's call sign down here and it's, uh, where he's located and so forth. Well, that's the kind of basic uh, free DV uh, setup. Uh, normally, is, uh, you need to add a headset. Obviously, you need a microphone, a uh, uh, way to hear the digital voice through a, a headset like this. The Skype works quite well. Some radios you can plug directly in. It has a USB port. Otherwise, you can go through a signal link, which is uh, compatible with the ham lib ham library for push to talk or uh, Rig Blaster is another uh, real popular one. Same one that you would use for other digital modes like PSK31. Uh, where did we operate? Uh, the watering hole is 14236, although we have a QSO finder that you can log in with just your call sign and it will show who's on the air and what frequency they are on. And there's also a, a chat channel there, a good place to uh, I get help. The author is a lot of times found on uh, 40 meters. There's quite a group of guys in uh, in VK land and, and also in Europe. I work 40 and uh, 75 meters. There's the SM1000. This is a digital voice adapter. Uh, sometimes it's called a smart mic. And it's an embedded uh, free DV in this box right here using an ARM processor. It's a microphone uh, size form factor. It actually has a mic and a, a speaker in it turns any single sideband radio or FM radio into DV radio. It has a bunch of built, uh, it's a built-in uh, rig interface for your microphone, speaker, and push to talk. Uh, it's again all open hardware and uh, software, and it's about two hundred dollars. Here's what it physically looks like. It's in a nice metal case. Uh, has a real good feel to it. Updates through the uh, USB. Uh, there's a, some LEDs here. To give you an idea for uh, uh, the levels and uh, whether you're in sync or not, uh, audio over here, uh, push to talk over here. Also, push to talk can be uh, controlled through an external push to talk line right here. For some reds, you can use an RJ45 cable, plug it right in, and then configure it uh, on right here uh, for particular lines that the RJ45 is. Uh, using uh, with uh, jumpers right here. There's some audio levels here. It does have a transformer interface and uh, there's the ARM uh, processor right there. It's a really nice uh, box. It makes it very easy to get on digital voice. Just plug it in and away you go. But here's some of the new modes uh, for VHF called 2400A. Um, it uses uh, twice as many bits. It's 5 kilohertz wide 6.25 uh, kilohertz spacing, much like FM. Uh, now this uh, uses a uh, 4FSK. Uh, the one I was just looking at, uh, showing you earlier, uh, that uses FDM, a frequency division multiplexing. It's in a non-coherent detection because that's a lot easier to use. The phasing is not in there as critical. 1,200 uh, symbols per second and 1,200 tone spacings. And the frames are 40 milliseconds. Uh, 96 bits for a frame, and there's 28 bits left over to do any routing and uh, texting and uh, no expansion. A mean discernible signal of minus 132 to 135, so it's pretty sensitive. And this is greater than, uh, it's about 10 dB over uh, FM in the current system, so this is a very robust uh, system that does require an SDR radio to use it with. There was some development work done on what was called a um, and I think it's still going on, 
with an SM2000, which is a uh, an SDR radio that will run this this mode here. The radio hasn't been completed as far as I know. I'm hopefully this year it will be. But this would run on something like a, a Hack RF1. Um, because SDR radios, they're really required to get the best performance goals out of your modems. The you know, RF bandwidth is 5 kilohertz, so that's a little bit wide for most single sideband radios. And it's a complete departure from being an FM radio uh, interface. So, you, you know, a lot of the rigs now are very friendly with FM, but this one, this one is not. You're going to have to have an SDR radio dedicated to use it with an API. It was designed without uh, compromise in the modem and to explore uh, new ground. Again, a lot of experimental work here, and David Rowe and uh, several other folks across the across the world are working on this. To, uh, and it's again all completely open source, and the goal is to uh, ultimately beat sideband. And I think they're going to be able to do it. Uh, 700C is a relatively new mode in HF. It uh, was recently developed, only uses 700 bits per second codec. That's a very low bit rate. It's similar speech quality to the 1600, but at half the rate. And it's combined with a new modem to uh, form uh, what's called FreeDV700C. Transmit diversity, it's actually sitting, it's send, sending two sets of streams, uh, and then it picks out uh, data from each one. Conversational QSOs that are a few dB SNR uh, on, on fading HF channel. It's really robust in, in fading. So what's coming soon is the uh, 700D mode. This is the one I think is going to beat sideband. Uh, it's Kodak 2 at 700 bits, which means we need less bandwidth. And we're kind of adding some forward error correction in this one, so there will be a little bit of latency, about 160 milliseconds. The, the ones previously that I've been talking about have very little, if any, latency. You push the talk, and out goes the voice. There's no training or anything for it. But we found that to be able to work down in the noise into minus 2 dB SNR, we're going to have to add some more uh, uh, coding for a forward error correction using low density parity checks. And I'm really looking forward to this. It's, it's very getting very close to being released. And I, I think in the next few months uh, we'll see this. And we'll see how, you know, what the DXers and some other folks think about this when you can copy a digital voice with a good uh, uh, quality audio uh, down, down into the noise. So 800XA, this is a, another new mode. Instead of PSK modem, it uses 4FSK. And uh, the advantage of this one is all of the previous uh, modes I'm talking about require Class A amplifiers uh, to, to avoid distortion, where this one we can run a Class C PA. So we can run quite a bit more power with this one, it's, it's going to be very competitive with a single side on VHF uh, with a mean uh, MDS signal minus uh, 37. So uh, that's really getting down in there. We might even be able to do some EME uh, with that one. So in summary, um, 1600 uh, now is the uh, standard mode. That's uh, what is the most popular one being used. Uh, 700C is a new lower signal noise uh, ratio, and 700D is coming error-free at uh, sub-zero SNR, which again should be single sideband, and the new uh, VHF uh, UHF mode. So uh, hope you can get on the air with 3DV or uh, purchase an SM1000 over the net and add 3D uh, as an API uh, to your software project. Um, uh, 3DV is on the Flex radios. They were one of the first ones to uh, add uh, 3DV to their radio. Uh, for more information, go to freedv.org or uh, uh, Bob Ro or David Rose site here, rotel.com. Uh, Any questions? Uh-huh. In signal noise ratio, yeah. in single sideband, you might you might be able to, uh, depending on the operator, be able to understand somewhat at zero dB SNR, but it would be way down in the noise. 
They're on uh, the Rotels.com website. He has a lot of sound bites. So you can go to those and, and you know, that would answer that question. Uh, let me see. I uh, have, we still got some battery left here, Carl. I think I've got some audio here. sounds like that's uh, actually 1300 and there's three, 300 bits of uh, four air correction in the actual codec but it almost eliminates uh, any uh, latency which uh, is a real concern on for quick turnaround on, on sideband so that's why he's worked to try to avoid that but it works quite well without um, uh, adding any uh, uh, a latency that really becomes a bother like some of the earlier digital voice systems did. Yes, sir. Uh, 